welcome back for our afternoon session here. And it's my honor again to be introducing one of our speakers uh, who is well known to most of you in the room, of course, uh, Dr. Nelson Rivera Garcia, uh, who has been on the faculty here at the seminary since 1998. And I thought, well, I'm not really introducing him to most of you. Most of you know him uh, pretty well. But I could maybe tell you some things that perhaps uh, you don't know. Many of you know that he received his PhD fairly recently from Temple University, but maybe you don't know the title of his dissertation, which I think is one of the great titles I've ever heard for a doctoral dissertation, The Earth is Our Home. I love that. The Earth is Our Home, subtitles Mary Midgley's Critique and Reconstruction of Evolution and Its Meanings. Some of you have taken courses in theology and science with Dr. Rivera. He is our resident expert on that. He's also our resident expert on the poetry of Pablo Neruda, and he can quote long stretches from memory. He's our resident expert on medieval Jewish philosophy. If you want to know about Maimonides, you ask him. He's actually our resident expert on Jewish philosophy in general. If you want to know about Franz Rosenzweig, the star of redemption, you ask him. If you want to know about early modern European philosophy like Leibniz and Spinoza, you ask him. If you want to know about Isaac Newton, you ask him. Actually, if you want to know about Kant's concept of transcendental space and Wittgenstein's concept of logical space, a comparison, you ask him because that was his bachelor's thesis at the Universidad <laughs> de Puerto Rico. Um, I think, what was I doing when I was 21? Oh, gee, <laughs> amazing. Dr. Rivera also has served pastorates in his native Puerto Rico. Uh, as many of you know, he did his Master of Divinity and his Master of Sacred Theology degrees at this school. He has contributed uh, many publications, both the church and academy. I want to particularly call attention to two of them, his work as editor and translator, translator for Ritos Ocasionales, which is uh, translation and expansion of the occasional services book that was connected with uh, the Lutheran Book of Worship, and that he was a major uh, director of that project, and also his nearly 30 contributions on different figures spanning not just church but, uh, but other related intellectual history uh, to the, for the, uh, the Diccionario Ilustrado de Interpretes de la Fe, edited by Justo Gonzalez, that's appeared in English and in Spanish and Portuguese, already a major research work. And here you have someone who wrote for that on people from the, the um, Arab philosopher Averroes, who was a major figure in preserving Aristotle eventually for so-called Christian Europe by way of Muslim Arab scholarship up to the modern uh, Episcopal bishop and theologian, William Temple. If you didn't already know that, if you didn't already know that Dr. Rivera knows about a lot of things, I've tried to convince you that he does. Uh, and we're really pleased to have him now responding uh, to this morning's fine presentations from Dr. Diefeld. So let us welcome Dr. Nelson Rivera. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, but you forgot to say that I like to say that theology is really my second vocation in life. If God had given me a good voice, I would be singing boleros. <laughs> but I love boleros, uh, but can't sing any. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the uh, invitation, really. The task of the Hein Frey lectures this year is to deal with Lutheran views, relationships, and contributions to other Christian communities throughout the world. Dr. Diefeld has done a wonderful job at addressing both 
what Lutherans have to offer to world Christianities and what Lutherans can receive from those other Christian experiences in today's world. First of all, I want to affirm what she has already contributed to the discussion, as well as to thank her for bringing these insights to our attention. As for my task, all I can do is to add a few reflections, my personal reflections, which are related and yet represent a, a slightly different approach to the questions and challenges at hand. In one sense, by virtue of adding the terms Lutheran and vocation and well Christianity together, the questions have certain specificity to it. After all, we think we know what people are talking about when we hear words like Lutheran vocation or Lutheran theology or Lutheranism for that matter, maybe also when we hear speak of world Christianity, either by intuition or by experience. Dr. Diefeld said very well from the start that Lutheranism is part of world Christianity. Two, and rightly so. Beyond that, we could argue that there are different ways of being Lutheran, of a speaking of the Lutheran vocation, of the place of Lutherans in world Christianity, or the very meaning of world Christianities, Christianity, or rather, if I like to say, Christianities. Of course, I can only speak from my own place, and evolution. I, for one, am called to interpret the text and commitments of the Lutheran experience. But my Lutheranism has also a specificity to it, while sharing with many other Lutherans quite a few of the questions, concerns, and theological insights. As you, as most of you already know, I was not born uh, a Lutheran or in the Lutheran church. Uh, I grew up in a Catholic culture, but attending a combination of Baptist and Christian Missionary Alliance churches because of my family. Uh, I came to the Lutheran church really when I was 20 during my college years. Um, and the reasons are varied. But one of them wa uh, was the, the tradition of theological reflection. Also, since I was studying philosophy and many of the philosophers were German Lutherans, I was very much attracted to Lutheranism. What did I know then that they, the philosophers were really bad Lutherans? But. <laughs> But that discussion for another day. <laughs> Lutherans, like others engaging in theological discourse, provide words, concepts, the description of experiences, and a way to connect all these parts as they, Lutherans, respond to the question about God from the condition of the restless and sinful soul. Lutherans have their own voice and accent. Lutheran theology is not the only grammar of faith, but it is one that I would dare to say has been tested many times over 
through time vis-a-vis -vis many other different theological voices, movements, and emphasis. So Lutherans have some distinctive ways of speaking about God and of God's activity in the world, especially in the midst of the human experience of sin and the need for redemption. Any theology worth its name has a way of talking about God in relationship with the world, God in relationship with us, the relationships among us humans, as well as of humans with other nature. Lutheran theologians use key words and concepts. For example, with Luther, we speak of God as a God who reveals himself or herself to humanity, while at the same time remaining hidden from us. As you probably know, God revealed and hidden are not two different or unrelated moments in the life of God. These are more like the two sides of God's face. Here, the stress is on the simultaneity in the dynamics between hiddenness and revelation. God is the revealed and hidden God for us. The beauty of this language is to allow for the admission of complexity when it comes to speak of God, while at the same time opening a space, even if narrow, for God talk, for theological discourse, properly speaking. As you know, Lutheran theology is very good at using the language of paradox. Seemingly contradictory, but equally true and necessary terms used when dealing with the activity of God. Thus, we use simultaneously the dual language of faith and works, law and gospel, human and divine righteousness, but without loosening the tension, nor by overcoming the dialectic between the terms. Now, in what follows, I would like to highlight some of the concepts presented in Dr. Diefeld's lectures and add some others for further reflection. I will use basically uh, six points and I will name them throughout so that you can actually follow uh, what I'm saying. One. Fundament, fundamentalism of many kinds. Dr. Diefeld has already explained the meanings of fundamentalism. Together with a survey of possible causes for its a strong presence in world Christianity. I especially like her way of associating these movements with the plight of the poor. As she said, the rise of fundamentalism is deeply related to political crisis, the social dislocation of vast populations, as well as the failure of religious and other leaders to address its reality and causes. And these are literally her words. I cannot help, 
help. But be reminded of the classic statement by none other than Karl Marx when writing in his critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, intimated that one of the outcomes of the practice of religion is to keep the poor in alienation to themselves as well as marginal to the prevalent social order. In the words of theologian Keith War, and I quote, Marx opposed the powers of organized religion, which he saw as oppressive and reactionary. But his attitude to religion is more ambiguous than is sometimes realized. Everyone knows the famous quotation, religion is the opium of the people. But not as many know the sentences that immediately preceded. Religious suffering is at the same time an expression of real suffering and a protest against real suffering. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the sentiment of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions." End the quote. Keith War adds about these remarks the following. They could have been written by a devout believer. Close quote. The paradoxical nature of any religious experience is such that it could lead, on the one hand, to freedom and resistance and, on the other hand, to new kinds of a slavery and oppression. For Dr. Diefeld, at least in the Latin American context, Christian fundamentalism served as a survival mechanism for those who had been socially and politically disenfranchised. Again, those are her actual words. It offers a kind of hope to the hopeless, a return to the future, an utopian reality where known has existed. What I gather is that fundamentalism with the promises of a prosperity theology for the poor and wretched, keeps a similar a stronghold to the one that Marx denounced. Of course, to understand something from within is not the same as to bless it. And that's probably another reason for the striking analysis and critique that Dr. Diefeld has offered us today. Two, literalism is not exclusive to the religious experience. In Dr. Diefeld's exposition, literalism is one of the salient aspects of fundamentalism. Of course, she is referring to biblical literalism, when Bible precepts for righteous living are interpreted literally and applied directly to actual practices. Unfortunately, Biblical literalism is sometimes used to justify a certain social order 
or to make social distinctions, especially as it is applied, as she very well said, to, to women's bodies. Dr. Diefeld's analysis is quite sharp on these points. All that said, I believe that in today's world, the problem of literalism is deeper than the misconceptions of the direct application of text to the human experience or the in inaccuracies of a doctrine of inerrancy of the scriptures. No one is that consistent or coherent, really, whether literalist or inerrantist in their interpretation and application of scripture, not even in the practice of figurative or literary interpretations of the Bible. Every interpreter, even if they lean in one direction, they actually draw from different views, tools, and resources. And I don't know, I, I still have to meet one literalist that is ever consistent with his or her applications of the text. In any case, what matters the most to me is that modern literalism is a cultural phenomenon, broadly speaking. It is part of our common Western heritage. Bear in mind that now I'm talking literalism and taking literalism to stand for the conviction that we humans are able to describe reality, to grasp it by using simple and unambiguous principles. One of the major <clears throat> contributors to a modern understanding of literalism is natural science. This is not new, it has been argued many times. The assertion that reality actually obeys our description of it, and that we actually know things as they really are, is basic to literalism of any kind that we can actually read and describe reality as it is. And if we add the practice of literalism in other world religions, we have to conclude that it is not only a Christian problem. It is more like part of the epistemological atmosphere of the times. Again, I think it has to do more with the impact of modern science than anything else. In any case, it must feel almost comforting to literalists to be able to rely on the descriptions of reality and our role in it in a way that anyone can understand, maybe even eliminating some of the complexities or ambiguities of life along the way. I'm not trying to defend practices of literalism. I'm, I'm just trying to understand where it actually comes from. Three. Justification and the, primacy, and the primacy of faith. Dr. Diefeld brings forth from the core of Lutheran convictions and witness the centrality of justification by faith, and appropriately so. It seems clear to me <clears throat> 
that justification works in her presentation as a critical theological principle, a kind of theological meta-language or an idiom that is used <clears throat> to judge the validity or falsity of other theological discourses, a type of theology, as she calls it. Moreover, justification by faith is also, and primarily so, the very definition of the gospel. It speaks about the life of those forgiven graciously by God and who live in communion with God and with one another through word and sacrament. Instead of having to work by our effort, our own righteousness, the latter is bestowed to us freely by faith in Christ alone. So these are the meanings of justification. Here, it is important to say that the faith of which we speak about is not merely a notion or a flat belief. There is too much at stake to, so as to think of faith as just another doctrine, perspective, or experience on life. In some sense, yes, it is all of the above. Faith is never inconsequential to human life. Faith changes everything. It is a different understanding of God, but also a distinctive understanding on us, of ourselves. We could call faith a critical reassessment of the human, and the human in relationship both to God and to others. For Luther, Faith is the real thing. It is born out of a struggle, out of the deepest doubts, and involved with the toughest conflicts of the human mind and heart. In his lectures on Genesis, Luther compares the struggles of faith to the story of Jacob in his fight against the heavenly creature, Genesis chapter 32. Luther understands the story to represent anyone who fights God, who calls God to the task by asking that the promises of God be fulfilled in him or her. It sounds like a kind of demand, a demand that we do not normally associate with faith, afraid, afraid that we will commit the sin of self-righteousness or pride. But I believe that Luther had something else in mind. Luther says, for example, this is a quote, in this manner, God is conquered when faith does not leave off, is not wearied, and does not cease, cease but presses and urges on. End of quote. Moreover, he put these words in Jacob's mouth. Quote, I will not let you Go unless 
you retract your judgment concerning me and give me the testimony that I have been blessed before God. End of quote. Faith comes very strong on the side of trust and relationship. Those who struggle with God <clears throat> deal with a presence that is real and active not with a figment of their own imagination. Faith is a matter of life and death. You live by faith in the midst of everything else, life as it is, in the very conflict of living, or you fall to something else, a religion of your own making, a more bearable faith in a more doable God. I believe this is what Luther really had in mind and what you could say bothered him so much that we would end, begin with some faith and end up with a belief of our own for which faith was not any longer necessary. A belief that would preclude any struggles or any questions for God. Four, <clears throat> I'm sorry for stop here. Can someone get me more water? And I'm sorry for it. Yes, you were right, you told me in advance. I didn't believe you. So see, I admit it in public. <coughs> Lutheran theology as critique of visibilia, visible things. One comment by Dr. Diefeld, when she mentions critically that for some Christians, and this is her actual quote, prosperity theology is a visible sign of God's grace. Reminded me of another aspect of Luther's thought, which I consider appropriate to our discussion today. Luther seems to have pondered about our, <clears throat> our natural tendency to look for God in majesty and greatness, at least as these are conceived by us. His ideas on this regard are set in the context of a number of theses about who the theologian, who is the theologian and what kind of approach does a true theologian use to speak about God. And probably most of you will recall the uh, Luther's thesis in the uh, Heidelberg uh, Disputation. For instance, Luther says, a person does not deserve to be called a theologian who looks upon the visible things of God as though they were clearly perceptible in those things which have actually happened. End of quote. On the other hand, and this is another quote, he deserved to be a theologian who comprehends the visible and manifest things of God seen through suffering and cross. End of quote. Well, 
we tend to associate God with big things. Whether it's power, knowledge, riches, beauty, you name it. With anything great and wonderful, did I mention powerful? <laughs> Anything worthy of praise and admiration. The problem is these experiences of power and greatness and riches and knowledge and beauty are given by human standards that might say very little or nothing about who God is and what God may want from us. As the late theologian Gerald Gerhard Fieldy explains, this is a quote, the invisible things of God we that we can supposedly see by this mode of operation are, in Luther's mind, such things as virtue, godliness, wisdom, justice, goodness, and so forth. They seem to be a collection of those things humans strive for, and therefore, human goals, end of quote. Again, they are human standards, and in the last analysis, they may say very little or probably nothing about who God actually is and what God does. Thus, we are in love or enamored with strength and success, with numbers of people and money, etc., with displays of power and authority. In this view, prosperity theology could be quite natural, although not necessarily good to the experience of many Christians around the world. But in fact, the God of the incarnation in Jesus shows a very different face. God's revealed face is quite different from what we normally expect. God shows his, her true being in humility and suffering, in the foolishness of a gracious message and messenger, in the death of the innocent one. The crucified one is God for us, God incarnate in human flesh. God was dying there on the cross. It surely sounds counterintuitive. And if so, then we have moved from the realm of language into the realm of rationality itself, meaning a theological rationality that names its own terms. By this, we do not mean to say that this kind of theological discourse is irrational. Nothing is farther from the truth. As a matter of fact, this theology is quite coherent in its analysis and presentation. But it also judges critically the way human reasoning normally works. When it comes to think God, 
since we normally look for God in the wrong places. Attention to visibilia, then, is one of the strongest temptations. A sure sign of God's activity, a sure sign of God's activity is not what we normally imagine it to be. A drastically different approach is needed like the one Luther uses in his lectures on Hebrews. There, Luther tackles the meaning of heavenly, as in chapter 9 of that letter, by relating it to our attitude towards visibilia. And there, thus, he says, a quote, to be heavenly is to despise the visible things and to cling to God alone, the divine good, that is, the divine will, in prosperity as well as in adversity, in life as well as in death." Close quote. From the critique of visibilia to the critique of theology itself. So that's point five. Critique of theology. Theology, or the theologian to be exact, Lutheran or otherwise, is never completely free from presuppositions, commitments, and assumptions. No one is completely aware of what his or her motive are or the why of all of his or her convictions. As, <clears throat> as as Luther learned quite well, some kinds of theologies could be used to support and even to justify systems of oppression instead of supporting the experience of freedom and a good consciousness. One of Luther's major contributions was a critique of the Roman church penance system of his time. It was as much a matter of controlling the religious consciousness of individuals as of sustaining the economy of the church. With the selling of divine forgiveness through indulgences, it was mostly the poor, commoners, and peasants who were being hurt. Moreover, the penance system also conferred an inordinate amount of authority and power over many lives to a few people, a few church leaders. Therefore, we cannot take for granted then or now the liberating power of any theology. Each one has to be judged and put to the test. I like to think that it, it happens to theology what Paul, St. Paul, said of himself that sometimes the good that he wants to do, he ends by not doing it. And the bad things that wants to avoid actually happened. For liberation theologians, theology itself can be quite ideological. 
meaning that it could end up legitimating a structures of social relations that benefit the few rather than the many. In ages past, theological argumentation has been used to justify different forms of human oppression. At the same time, some forms of theological argumentation have worked closely with emancipation and freedom movements. It all shows that, <clears throat> that theology is never done in a void, in a vacuum, that, <clears throat> that it is shaped while able to shape a variety of social programs. As a matter of fact, theology is not only a matter of argumentation. It also has consequences for living in real time. Today, we would say that it has an ethical dimension or ethical implications. Any kind of theological discourse could be judged too not just by their argument, by, by its arguments. Of course, there are, there, there's good argumentation and lousy argumentation, sound arguments and bad arguments, and theology, any theology have to be judged by its argumentation, but also by the consequences to ethical living. Six, from theology to praxis. In her discussion of the two kingdoms, theory, and its possible application to a political theology, Dr. Diefeld believed that this theory should, in a way, make it easy for Lutherans to, and this is a, a quote from her presentation, make it easy for Lutherans to see when public officers are not carrying out their, their democratic duty and when Christians are called to advocacy on behalf of those who are disenfranchised, end of quote. All that said, the historical record shows that this doesn't always happen, as she has also shown to us. That generally speaking, Lutheran have been a bit slow to value and therefore embrace democracy in a positive way in many parts of the world. At that point, she concludes that the fact that Luther had a good theology does not necessarily imply that it led to orthopraxis, close quote. And she was also quoting from, if I recall, uh, theologian Guillermo Hansel, who teaches in Argentina. It should not surprise anyone to say that this is a very important question. Again, not just about Lutheran theology, about any theology. Part of me will, will, will be tempted to repeat what has been said in many circles before, that Luther did not develop a political theory as such. His concern was thoroughly theological. Luther's doctrine of the two governments of God can be better understood in parallel to his emphasis on the word of God as coming to us in law and gospel and to his view of the Christian life as the experience 
of the paradox of being justified and sinner at the same time. In the same way, a Christian lives now in both the secular and the spiritual spheres or realms. What Luther wanted to avoid was the confusion of the two governments or the two kingdoms. <clears throat> when we introduce any force in the spiritual sphere, we forget that it is Christ's kingdom, which was founded by the word of God and in the righteousness that comes by faith alone. However, in the secular kingdom, law and order must reign. If they are lacking, the result is the loosening of evil forces, etc. All that said, I think that the original question is deeper. It makes me wonder whether any theology can claim to have a good political record. This is the kind of question that liberation theologians try hard to answer. The problem seems to be the persistence of ideology. Ideology, in its classical formulation, is a system of ideas normally concealed which affects social relations and ways of production. Ideology thrives on the symbolic power of abstract ideas. It is able to transform the opinions of ordinary human beings on daily life. It, it is the tendency of many societies to believe that ideology is something that happens to other groups, other nations, other societies, other peoples. What happens with ideologies and systems of ideas everywhere is, as Mary Mishley likes to say, that they are part of philosophical plumbing. Uh, society, I mean, the, 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 the image to plumbing is, plumbing is that thing that we are not constantly thinking about, right? It's, it's underground, it's underneath, it's, it comes to our attention when it stops working, when water starts overflowing. When they dig, then they find out that it's a very weird system of connections. In the city of Philadelphia, then you will see that if they dig, they still find uh, may still so here and there a wooden pipe or a clay pipe or an iron pipe, uh, um, PVC pipes or whatever they're using nowadays. And it's very odd how they are connected. It works. Again, the, the point is at some point it stops working and it has to be replaced. So it happens with systems of ideas and ideologies that are the undercurrents of any society when something stops working, when it creates problem, then we are made aware that there's such a thing as ideologies or systems of ideas that actually dominate our way of thinking and acting or looking at things as a group. The late theologian Juan Luis Segundo wrote that ideology is also the tendency to commit ourselves to certain interpretations of the human reality before the actual experience of that reality. 
It means to bring a structure that is then imposed to what we confront. It's like saying we have the interpretation even before we are confronted with the situation. The theologian is in a tricky position. She or he is always dependent on systems of ideas that try to explain the human condition, including the analysis and description of the political situation. These philosophical and sociological keys to the understanding of the human experience are not given by divine revelation. Thus, the theologian, like anybody else, has to choose among political systems and movements those that shed more light on the processes of freedom. But the theologian does more than use other people's ideas, as Segundo also said, a quote, by bringing to this practical judgment of a social system pre-established notions of, for example, freedom and grace, he or she can actually be supplying this social system with the most powerful ideological weapons for holding Christians aloof from social change." End of quote. Thus, no theology or political theology for that matter is ever free from having to make some choices among theories of society, economics, political theories, in brief, about the body politic, how it works, what it is, for its analysis and discourse. Our ideological commitments inevitable as these are, plus the sense in which faith, because it's faith, imposes preconditions to historical realities, affects the way that we do theology. But again, that's for everyone. As a way of conclusion, theology needs to be conversant with culture, history, and society. Lutheran theology cannot be constrained to the church or the academy. The world, society, culture, these are its proper places for discourse. No doubt, this emphasis is transparent in Dr. Diefel's remarks. These places have their, their unique languages and dynamics. They are multilingual and socially multidimensional. Therefore, theology, or rather the theologian, needs to learn to be converse, conversant with culture. At the heart of Lutheran theology, there is the conviction that theology responds to actual questions, to concerns, life situations. It has an existential core, so to speak. It is good for the theologian to learn other languages too, 
And here, I refer to those of, among others, the natural sciences, sociology, ethics, and philosophy, and others. In the context of world Christianities, Lutheran have gifts of their own that they could bring to the table. By the same token, there are the gifts that we could receive from others as Dr. Diefeld has shown us today. In either case, without the kind of gracious hospitality, the hospitality that sees itself in the other, or the host that sees himself or herself as a guest among others, as our Dean, Dr. Paul Rajasekhar, has taught us many times, without that kind of hospitality and graciousness, true learning and exchange cannot happen. This brings me now to my last point, which could have easily been my first point. Theology any theology, and certainly a Lutheran one, is contextual because it obeys to, is shaped by, and is mindful of the weight that class, gender, race, education, politics, economics, you name it, the way that these have upon it. As I said at the beginning, I can only speak from my own place and evolution. I'm called to interpret the text and commitments of the Lutheran experience as well as the Christian experience, of course, at large. But my Lutheranism has a specificity to it. While sharing with many other Lutherans quite a few of the questions, concerns, and above all, this relentless faith in an ever revealed and yet hidden but always gracious God. I think that's the bottom line. Uh, is Lutheran theology or the Lutheran witness or the Lutheran mission, the dialogues that Lutherans engage in, if they are not conducive to a common witness about this faith and this God, then definitely something big will be missing. Thank you. I want to thank uh, uh, our speaker, primary speaker, uh, and uh, okay, uh, uh, one that I felt, and she wants to have a word of a response to Professor Nelson. It is not a response in six points. I just wanted to say how much I have enjoyed my day here with you, and uh, especially how much and how deeply I appreciated uh, Professor Rivera's response. I think you chose among the faculty. You have outstanding faculty. I don't have to say that. Um, but you chose somebody who could really represent this type of hospitality and um, really um, showing a sense of um, uh, that we take the opportunity to engage in conversation. If I had presented the same lecture in some other context, I could tell you it could be shredded apart piece by piece. And I could give you, you know, what the shortcomings of the, the whole two lectures actually are. But I think that's not the point. I think the point is 
coming here and sharing my own very limited perspectives on Christianity, my experiences, the things that I've seen, the things that I still would like to do, and um, see that through the eyes of somebody else. And I think uh, Professor Rivera really um, showed that there is so much more, there's such a wealth, uh, and there are so many possibilities of uh, using this as points of departure. And I know that all of you, um, as you were listening, um, made connections with the things that you have seen, the things that you have done, and what you have studied. Um, this is, for me, um, always an opportunity to acknowledge uh, that every counter is an experience of grace. And at the end of the day, it is the grace of God that we are here. It is the grace of God that we have the gift of life, that we have the privilege of sitting and reading and writing and uh, discussing about all of these ideas. And that, in fact, what it is that we do also has a change in terms of the transformation of ourselves, of our community, and hopefully of the world at large. And I think in that sense, I really appreciate for the joint work that we did this day because we worked hard, <laughs> I have to say. And thank you so much uh, for your hospitality and for welcoming me here today. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for your gracious words, and uh, we enjoyed your presentation. I know this is the first of the four present four seminaries that you're visiting, and I'm I'm glad that uh, we you, we began with a very positive appreciation of uh, your contribution to this discussion, and I also want to uh, appreciate the contribution of my colleague uh, Nelson Rivera. We knew he's profound, and you saw it, and you heard it, and. Uh, uh, that's one of the reasons that uh, we admire him as a colleague at this institution. And finally, thanks to all of you for uh, attending the whole day today for lectures. And uh, uh, thanks for those who ask questions. And I hope we will think through uh, the topic. Uh, the world Christianity is a, it's a new topic uh, in the theological uh, discussions. Uh, it has to be unpacked so much because of the diversity of uh, the meanings the word connotes and so forth, but uh, this is a good beginning and thank you so much. So we, we adjourn for this day. Thanks.